you know, going back to the uh, to the horror story, we we uh, we just did an inspection for um, for a lady that just closed down a home not too long ago, and uh, she invited us. It was already closed, and she asked us to come through. And uh, unfortunately, we found two of the four walls were were displaced and and moved uh, bowing and cracking uh, to a point where there needed to be excavation. Any large deposit, and that is more than 50% of your gross monthly income, we have to source where it came from with documentation. If it was a transfer from another account, we need statements on that account to show where it came from. If it was money you had under your mattress at home, we suddenly can't use it. There's no way to track where that came from. The concern there is, did they go take out an unsecured loan someplace? I just had one where the customer took a, an advance on a credit card and deposited it into his bank account. We can't use those funds. They are not acceptable for a down payment on a house. Hey, welcome to another edition of the Smart Start podcast brought to you by the Equitable Bank. I'm your host, Tom Statler. Today, it's all about finding a new home. Whether it's buying that dream home or downsizing as empty nesters, we want to walk you through the information that will take some of the uncertainty out of buying and selling your home. First, we're joined by Rachel and Dino Flores. Rachel is a multi-award winning member of the Remax Lakeside team. Dino and Rachel had partnered for many years, and over the past several years, Dino has pivoted into founding Goodland Inspections. Thanks for both of you to join Thank us. Thank you. Thank you for having Thank us. For having Let's start uh, in the beginning. What uh, is a consistent refrain from what we're hearing from home uh, potential home sellers? I'm afraid to sell my home without having my new home under contract. How do you address this type of anxiety? Yeah, so we're kind of definitely seeing that a lot of times right now. Um, and kind of what we start with is we're always saying the main three things is that we're finding out is number one is definitely, you know, are you ever considering doing a bridge loan? Um, so that's always number one where you can kind of carry both of your payments. Um, and then number two is, is what happen if we sell your house and then you ask for some post occupancy, um, you know, for maybe three or four months, you know, worst case. And then after that, if you still don't find your new house, um, you know, maybe, you know, do you have a family member or, you know, somewhere you can definitely plan on going? And then the third option is always, um, what we literally just did um, about on Friday, we closed a deal um, that we said, okay, let's close your close your property right now, put it up for sale, close it, get your money in the bank, and then take your time finding a new property to buy. Um, and they're gonna stay with their folks for the next, you know, however long it takes. I said, don't have like a time, you know, restraint or anything, cause you don't wanna just buy your first house or anything. So yeah, so those are kind of the three main options. So bridge loan, um, post occupancy, and then number three, just stay with a family member or some kind of rental situation until you find your dream house is the three common, you know, most what we're seeing every day. Sounds good. Uh, with inventory levels remaining underwhelming, uh, another frequent occurrence to get offers uh, to the front of the line is waiving of financing, appraisals, and inspections. Why might this not be a really good idea? I'll let you start with that, Dino. Well, I, I, you know, we're, we're seeing that a lot, especially in this marketplace where uh, in order to get, you know, it's so competitive in order to get your offer accepted, um, you know, there's there's a lot of different things that you can do to get that to, to make your offer a little more attractive to the to the home seller. Uh, one of those items is is waiving your your appraisal contingency. Um, we, we try to shy away from that because uh, it's not really the best approach, especially if you're a first time home buyer, you got limited resources. Uh, but uh, if, if you're a little more of a, of a seasoned buyer, maybe you do got, you know, uh, some, some funds in, in the bank that you might be able to cover uh, whatever uh, is short on the appraisal, maybe that's not a bad idea. So what we got to do is we got to sit down, we got to go with the client, we got to go over, you know, what are your fan finances look like? Um, you know, what's the best approach for you and your family, you know, when, when you're looking to purchase this house, but looking to waive, you know, those type of contingencies is something that we really don't, you know, want to do. Uh, but unfortunately in this market is so tight, you know, sometimes it's, it's, you know, if if you don't do some of these things, you might not get your your offer considered. Um, you know, when when it's sitting in front of a, a a homeowner, you know, because they're they're looking at, you know, five to ten offers in some cases, maybe even more, and um, and 
you know, we're, we're dealing with cash buyers. We're dealing with all different types of buyers that, that are, that are submitting offers. And, um, and that's where we really got to sit down with our client and find out what's best for them, you know, because, you know, there, there's some clients out there that, that are able to do that. They're able to waive their financing or their, their appraisal contingency. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, or, or, uh, they can cover a portion of that. Um, you know, so so if that's the case, we like to sit down with them and 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 talk about those things. But uh, in this marketplace, I think we're going to continue seeing a little bit of that mm. uh, for the remainder of this year, possibly into next year. Um, you know, unless something really major happens in the marketplace. Uh, but uh, this is what we're seeing right now. So not something that we recommend doing, but yeah. it's an option. It's it's really an option for a, a, a buyer client to consider yeah. if they really love that home and if it really fits their needs. And they have the cash. And, and they, they have the, the cash. So yeah. if it comes in short because, you know, they, 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 they're, they're going to have to make the offset if for some right. reason that happens. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, and waiving that inspection, wow, that's like definitely, you know, it's it's very, very been common lately, um, but waiving that home inspection, we always, always suggest if you're going to waive the home inspection, then at least purchase a home warranty that might cover, you know, stuff for the first year um, with just a small $100 deductible on most of the plans. So that's another thing we've been recommending. And then kind of pivoting to yeah. the home inspection yeah. side of it, uh, us on the on the, uh, the home inspection company side of it, uh, we've been doing a lot more home inspections for people that have already closed. Mm. Um, so that's a, a new phenomenon mm-hmm. that we're that we're, that we're seeing come through. Um, I think at one at one point I was I counted four out of ten inspections that we were doing mm. were for for uh, clients that have already closed. A mm. um, little bit of a different you know type of uh, uh, situation yeah. because you know it all depends on what we find yeah. and uh, and what they bought because that's what they're telling us. Tell us what we bought. Yeah, you know right. so it's. It's a different situation, sure. but it's happening. Yeah, and then they want to run back to the seller. Why didn't you disclose? Why didn't you disclose? You know, yeah. so and it's like, oh, yeah. yeah. And what's their really? What is their recourse? Is yeah, there really yeah. Recourse? Well, and like, and th- the one thing that we always say is, listen, you know, when when you're looking to buy a house, you know, there's a real estate condition report that you should really look at. Um, talk, you know, if you're if you're under buyer agency, make sure that your agent explains these things to you. Um, what what does it mean waiving a home inspection? You know, and and what what am I walking into if I do that? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's all about having proper information. Mm-hmm. You know, and and once uh, you know, our job is to, is to give them the information so that they can make a well informed decision about what's best for them. Sure. And then another uh, is there also now it, looking at from the seller's perspective, if I'm ready to sell a home, what should I do to be prepared? I've heard possibly of people actually being proactive and doing a inspection in advance of them putting their house on the market is that an occurrence or something that's a, you're seeing it oh yeah we're, we're seeing uh we're seeing a lot of uh we're getting a lot of uh clients that are reaching out and saying hey we're, we're looking to list you know in the next month or mm-hmm. two uh we really want to see what we have you know and 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 maybe take care of some some of those things uh so we've been doing a lot more of the uh the pre-listing inspections um the nice thing is, is that we at Goodland Inspections will come back once, you know, we'll give them a list of things mm-hmm. that came up on, on on the inspection. And then once they have those things cured or, or corrected, mm-hmm. uh, we'll come back and, and we'll kind of do a, 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 an update it, an, an update to that inspection. Okay. So so it's a benefit in that sense. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then what should a seller do to prepare themselves for a sale? You're, do you typically go to the house yep, and yep. walk through it with them? Yep, yep. Usually um, right when they say, hey, we're ready to put our house up for sale, I say, okay, well, let's just meet, you know, three, four weeks ahead of time so I can kind of do a pre-listing walk through, mm-hmm. you know, go room by room. If I see like a crazy paint color somewhere, like dark brown, you know, blacks, you know, in some kids' rooms, let's lighten those rooms up so that, you know, if it's for the new buyer's two-year-old, they want it to be nice and cheery, not, you know, mm-hmm. look dark brown or dark grays for the teenager that's currently living there. <laughs> um, so we kind of, like, go through room by room and, you know, and even, like, just downspouts, you know, just from being married to the home inspector, you know, just going through and saying, hey, all these downspouts need to be six feet at least from your foundation. Um, so I kind of walk them through and then, you know, like, hey, you know, this might be called during the home inspection, you know, 
put some downspouts on there, just little things, or hey, cha- you know, change out your furnace filter. The home inspector is going to open that up, and if he sees that it's a nice new, you know, filter, he's going to say, hey, they take good care of it. But if it's old, full of dog hair, they're going to say, hey, these people never maintain things. Their furnace, you know, look right here. Um, so just little things that we definitely walk through the house and go room by room to make sure that you know the kitchens are nice and clean. I'll literally check for cobwebs. You know, just do a really, really deep look around and you know and then a lot of times the sellers have no pads and they're walking through room by room you know okay I need to move this you know chair over here she said or I need to move this um yeah and I do have a lot of staging background too so that Mm. you know helps with a lot of that different like living room planning and you know just making sure that the spaces look nice and open so get rid of all the kids toys that yeah. are sitting in the middle of the room. Yep, yep, hide the gates and yeah, yeah, <laughs> picture day, we don't want to see baby gates and stuff like that laying around or toys. We want to look really neutral and open, kind of yeah, like a model home I always tell them. Hide the personal stuff. Gotcha. So, um how about curb appeal? Is that something that uh, plays a role into it too? If it, you know, if it's the middle of winter, obviously there's going to be some points of difference, but uh, are there things that they want to look for in terms of once that potential buyer comes and pulls into the house? Yep, yep. We always, always, always focus on curb appeal. Even before any buyers are going to schedule any showings, they're going to definitely most likely drive past the home. Mm. Um, so what we always, always suggest is like, okay, it's springtime. What, what would you want to see? You know, we definitely want to see nice manicured grass. You know, if you cut the grass on a nice angle, put some nice, fresh, you know, bright, you know, yellow tulip on the front um it's all about curb appeal so anything you can do to make that front entrance you know you don't want to have a missing light bulb or anything like that um some bright tulips for the front and when fall comes i always say let's do some you know bright yellow mums and stuff like that because people are going to be driving past and you know if they see the garbage cans in front of the gar you know in front of the um the garage door that's a big turn off so i always say hide those garbage cans get those you know back inside the garage we don't want you know people drive-bys don't want to see garbage cans and stuff they want to see bright colored flowers and well man manicured lawn so i always say you know cut that grass every three four days when we're up live right away oh boy I yeah or somebody <laughs> keep a straight line <laughs> so when we're talking about what are some of the things okay we've talked about kind of the uh, waving inspections and things of that nature any horror stories you can share with <laughs> us that might come to fr- come to mind in terms of why did we why did you do that (laughs) one one thing you know just just kind of uh talking about that is is you know i I, with my real estate background you know showing houses i've been doing this since 1998 your child man (laughs) so um so one thing that i've learned from going from uh, you know to hundreds and maybe even Mm -hmm. thousands of home inspections throughout my career Mm -hmm. Um, and asking questions of home inspectors, you know, how, how do I better show a house? And I, and I think the one thing that I that I tell agents is take a flashlight with you. You know, that's the best tool that you can have. Mm. Um, and you know, in a market like we're in today, where you know you might be asking that client to to waive a home inspection if they want that house because there's so much uh, competition on it. Do your due diligence. You know, read the condition report. You know, if there's anything obvious to you. Uh, if you see water in the basement, I know you're not going to go through a house like a home inspector would, mm-hmm. uh, but you can look for things that are somewhat obvious and, and and maybe point those out and really try to control those emotions, you know, so that you know a buyer has doesn't have those surprises. But uh, you know, going back to the uh, to the horror story, we we uh, we just did an inspection for um, for a lady that just closed down a home not too long ago. And uh, she invited us. It was already closed, Close. and she asked us to come through. And uh, unfortunately, we found two of the four walls were were displaced and and moved, uh, bowing and cracking, uh, to a point where there needed to be excavation. You know, I we helped her contact you know uh, companies that that could give her more information about foundations. Um, there was asbestos in the home, you know, so there were there were three or four major items that came up. And unfortunately, she already closed on a home, mm. you know, so so that was an unfortunate thing. Yeah. You know, I'm not saying that the realtor should have known those things, you know, but, uh, you know, if you see cracks in the foundation, those are the biggest things that that as a home inspector, you know, I would advise a realtor, you know, look for those things. On both you know. sides, the yeah. seller and the buyer. On yeah. both sides. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, and the sooner those things are, are found out. You know, we can work. We can work through those things. As realtors, uh, we've we've gone through you know 
all kinds of foundations inspections and and we navigate the process on how to get those things resolved and fixed and and you know everybody's everybody's uh happy for that so so do your due diligence but yeah there's some definite horror stories out there okay. yeah and then when you have <clears throat> you've got several offers presented mm -hmm. to your buyer <clears throat> what's the process and going through each of those and what what's going to be the things that are going to stand out and what are the things that are going to cause you pause and and when you're communicating that with your buyer um with my buyer yeah okay so um so if i'm if a i'm sorry seller seller I'm seller sorry. okay yeah because yeah. i was like got multiple offers yeah, with yeah, the seller. okay yeah, yeah. so with this with a seller um so if i have multiple offers um on one of my sellers deals um so what we kind of do is right away we kind of make graphs on each offer um so some of the highlighted points is always going to be earnest money okay so this one for instance i just had this like two days ago so one had earnest money of ten thousand one had earnest money of two thousand so right away that ten thousand really to, stood out. Mm -hmm. And then another big thing is always going to be the um, appraisal gap. Is there any appraisal gap in there? Are they totally waiving the appraisal? Are they trying to do some kind of gap that they'll, you know, pay a difference of, you know, five or 10,000? For instance, this one had an appraisal gap of 12,000. Mm -hmm. And then another biggie that we always kind of do the graph for is going to be the home inspection. Are they waiving the home inspection? Are they going to cover a part of the home inspection that they won't ask for any defects, you know, the, for the first $2,000? Um, we see that a lot. Um, we won't ask for any repairs if the repair is under two thousand um, dollars. So that's like another really, really highlighted important category. And then also, of course, price and fi um, well, financing. And also. financing yeah. too. Yeah, financing too. We take a look at, make sure that they, you know, how much are they going to put down? Um, is it, you know, like an FHA loan where they might be a little weaker of a buyer or considered a little weaker mm -hmm. of a buyer with credit score and less down payment money? So yeah, so financing is a big one. You know. And, just and, to really see the down payment and and we you know we we, we take the steps to to call the the, the loan officer mm -hmm. or the lender and mm -hmm. say hey you know we're sitting here with with your customer you know mm -hmm. we we just you know we we know that there's certain things that they can't tell us but we just want to make that connection um and and that really you know lowers you know it, it lowers that temperature mm -hmm. you know when we're talking to the to the seller where mm -hmm. you know he, they're concerned about certain things yeah. and say hey we spoke to the loan officer yeah. they gave us the thumbs up yeah. you know so you know, have your buyer prepared, you yeah. know, a proper pre-approval, you know, whatever it is, and, and put the loan officer on notice that he may be getting a call mm -hmm. or she may be getting a call from, from a realtor just to say, hey, we're sitting with your with your customer. Sure. We just want to get the thumbs up, you know, and that, that helps us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With, 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 the, with the seller. Yeah, big time when the loan officer says, oh, man, these people are golden, golden, golden. And I'm like, oh, okay, this is good, you know, or else, you know, they start to talk a little too much and you're like, okay, well, you know, it doesn't sound like they're too qual, you know, so you kind of pick their brain a little bit. Yeah. A little bit, you know, yeah. it, it's limited to they, what they yeah, can say. They can't we say know that. Much, but, but uh, golden is nice to hear. But that pre-approval, um, when you see that pre-approval, are there red flags that you see on that sometimes, or what? What other than the fact that it says the equitable bank? Are there other things <laughs> that? Are there red flags sometimes that you might see when you see that pre-approval? Yeah, ever so often, like on one of mine, I just caught that um, they had put an offer in on a single family and then it said pre-approved for a two family. Mm -hmm. So I called up the lender and I was like, why does it say the pre-approval is a two family? Oh, well, they do need that, you know, additional income to qualify. And I'm like, well, what the heck can mm -hmm. they qualify? And then I, you know, and then it turned out that that buyer didn't qualify. Mm -hmm. So I was like, OK, well cross off this offer, let's look at the other ones. So mm -hmm. yeah, so it's really, really, you know, good to really read those offers, you know, the pre-approvals very, very carefully, because ever so often you'll catch an error that can bite you two, you know, two, three weeks down the line. And now those other buyers that put the offers and now walked and they're gone. What, uh, when you have an inspection, uh, the necessity to have that home inspection, what are some of the things that like, as a realtor, both of you obviously being realtors, what are some of the things that you could say, you know, that's not the end of the world if, it, mm -hmm. when you're talking to your buyer, you know, or, and what are the things that definitively need to, what are some of the things that definitively need to be taken care of before you would say, let's go ahead and mm -hmm. uh, waive that inspection? Yeah, a great question. Um, and, and, and I think, you know, the way that our approach is uh, to our clients when we're doing a home inspection um, is we're, we're just, you know, not pointing out red flags. Oh, this is wrong. This mm -hmm. is wrong. This is wrong. Um, we, we try to do some educating mm -hmm. and saying, you know what, you know, most houses in, in, 
in Wisconsin, you know, have poor grading. Mm. That causes water to come into the basement. Gutters are clogged. Downspouts need extensions. I mean, in most cases, that was, that's what we're seeing. Eight out of 10 homes. Um, so we could say, you know, major defect, major defect, or we can, uh, you know, educate the buyer and say, listen, you know, here's where you buy the dirt. This is the type of dirt you mm. get. You know, one weekend, you invite your friends over, feed them, you know, maybe you know, buy a by by twelve pack or something. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and get the work done, you know, and, and then, you know, that really helps that buyer understand that look, there's home maintenance that we need to do, but then there's there's defects that do need to be talked about, you know, um, environmental issues, foundation issues, um, you know, roof issues, you know. So all those things uh we do look at, but we try to put it in perspective, uh, because, you know, it's so difficult for these buyers to find a home. Uh, and, you know, we could just be inspectors that, hey, we're just doing our job, everything's mm -hmm. a red flag, but we want to try to help that process. I think it's more right now, you know, everybody should be working as a team to try and get these deals to a closing. Um, you got your realtors, your loan officers, your inspectors, you know, and if, you know, and, and if we provide the right information to the client, you know, maybe that's the home that they're going to close on, you know, so a lot of realtors that I work with, you know, they, they appreciate that because, you know, the, the business that we're in, you know, there's, mm -hmm. there's inspectors that, you know, do their own thing a certain way, but uh, that's how we take, that's how we take that approach. Terrific. Mm -hmm. Rachel and Dino Flores, thanks for joining us on the Smart Start podcast brought to you by the Equitable Bank. Thank, Thank you. you. For Thank you for having us. us. We're now joined by Kara Reese and Wendy Luanovich, both vice presidents and senior mortgage lenders at the Equitable Bank. Combined, they have a lot of years of experience in mortgage lending. <laughs> With potential home buyers who still have uh, an existing home to sell, what are some of the options they can do to financing options that they can to not have to list their home before they buy a new home? Well, we're seeing a lot of that coming through, obviously. Um, usually I'm asking them, first of all, if we can afford to keep both homes. Um, that's huge. We have to run the numbers. But also, um, they tend to not remember that they need a down payment because they were going to use the proceeds from their sale. Um, so then we look at options like maybe uh, taking money from a 401k for that, um, taking a home equity loan, or we call it a bridge loan in that case. So it's a short-term home equity loan where we can pull some of the cash out that they need for the down payment. Um, gift, they can use gift funds from a family member. These are all things that will give them the minimal down payment at least. And then once their house is sold, they can um, apply those additional proceeds to their loan and recast their loan. Is there a preferred option, do you think? What of any of those, if they, let's say I'm able to qualify for both, I have a lot of equity in my current home that I would assume would help in terms of being able to qualify for that type of loan? If they have money in savings, that's the best option to go with. If we can avoid a bridge loan is another loan. There's mm -hmm. going to be some additional closing costs involved with doing that. Mm -hmm. So if they've got funds available for the down payment, if they can borrow from a 401k, we don't have to count that payment as a debt in qualifying either because they're paying themselves back. Mm -hmm. So those are the first options we would try to use. If we have to go to a bridge loan and they qualify with a bridge loan payment though, we can certainly go that route. It's gonna take a little more time because we have to have time to set that loan up and have those funds available, so. When you're getting into a, a, a pre-approval, what are typical? What are some of the more typical hiccups that you're finding, especially when somebody's looking, has an existing home and finding, looking for a new home? What are the typical hiccups you find? Well, I think what a lot of people are trying to do or hoping to do yeah. is to sell that house still in time to purchase the new house. Okay. Um, and I think with the market changing a little bit, that's going to be a little bit more difficult. So I guess I would call that a hiccup because yeah. then they're not able to use the proceeds that they thought they would to um, put down on the, the other house. So it's kind of living out in that limbo of I'm trying to I need to I want to buy this home I want to put an offer on the home but I don't want to sell this or I I have to wait or I have to put a contingency on is that sometimes kind of what you're talking about their plan is to sell yeah. the house and they just hope that yeah. they'll sell it but we have to look at it as one way or the other if yeah. we're doing a pre-approval mm -hmm. are we doing it with your home sale or not mm -hmm. and if not then we have to have all of those other details figured out where the down payment's coming from if you qualify if they end up selling the house before they close on the new one and they've got those fun great it's easy for us to backtrack then and go that route but we have to look at it as a worst case scenario um what should a borrower or referral source expect 
out of their lender itself. Good service. Somebody who's going to be um, responsive to their questions. Um, we're getting a lot of rush pre-approvals. People know they want to be looking for houses, but have procrastinated on getting the pre-approval done. So a lot of Saturday phone calls from people that need a pre-approval right now to go make an offer on a house. So you want a lender who's going to be responsive to that and be able to help you if if that's what's needed. Ideally, we'd prefer that they do the pre-approval before that point, but sometimes that doesn't happen. And we've been finding a lot of um, those rush approvals are because other lenders have not are not available on the weekends or in the evenings. So mm -hmm. um, I guess, you know, when thinking about the real estate agent, that's maybe something they should be asking too, is if their lender is going to be available if they do need that rush pre-approval. Um, what should that pre-approval look like when it goes out, when you type it up or whatever, you're not typing it up, but what should that pre-approval look like when it's presented to the borrower and or their realtor? It's good for them to know that an underwriter has actually reviewed the file um, that we've collected income and asset documentation. And I think most realtors in the area know that with equitable bank pre-approvals that that's normally the case, that we have fully underwritten the borrower and we know that they're good and it's just a matter of the property and getting an appraisal if one's needed. Um, but they need to make sure that the amount on the pre-approval is going to cover what they're looking at. I get a lot of requests. I did a pre-approval for someone, and they're out looking at homes that are more than what they're pre-approved for. So they need to make sure that they're staying within the limits of their pre-approval, or if they're going to be looking higher, they need to get a new pre-approval. Do you tend to look and uh, when you see that somebody might qualify, their ratios are all in line? Obviously, people you don't want to question people's budgets, but you know, do is that common to ask the question? Are you possibly, you know, you're you could be approved for four hundred and fifty or five hundred thousand dollars. Do you sure you only want a two hundred fifty thousand yeah. dollar mortgage? Or a lot of times, I ask them what they're comfortable with as far mm -hmm. as a payment because that's huge. Mm -hmm. um, as far as every different property, right? The ta the real estate taxes are going to be mm -hmm. different, so they could be, you know, and that's another thing with the pre approval letter is they have to pay attention to what that payment is on the letter because if the taxes that we haven't qualified for are 5000 and this property has you know $8,500 in property taxes, it's going to make a big difference with that payment. Um, and a lot of times the borrower will say it's monthly payment more than it is purchase power, right? They, they need to be comfortable with that. And when you get to that tax, uh, you know, when the, are, are you able to provide them, let's say that they found a home? And you see that, uh, was that really, you know, do you leave enough room in when you're talking about that? Obviously, you're having that conversation, but do you share with them that it might depend on where you're buying? Oh, home? yeah. Yeah. If, if a customer, I usually will do my pre-approvals for the amount the customer asks for. Sure. And if that is putting them at their max based on the monthly payment, because when you do a pre-approval, we're really pre-approving you for the monthly payment amount, not a price, not a loan. Mm -hmm. There's variables, the property taxes, the interest rates. If the interest rates go up, you might not qualify for a $200,000 house anymore because that payment amount just went up. Um, so if I have a customer who's at their max, I will tell them you need to Keep an eye on that payment amount. This is what I used for those property taxes because if you go above that, you're not going to qualify. So that's just so that they know. And I think most realtors also understand, and a lot of them know how to run their own payment figures to make sure that if they're looking at a house with a buyer, that they're not going to be over. Yeah. Go ahead. I always tell people too to give me a call if if they're wondering if they're going to qualify or there's some variable that's very different than what we had them approved for. I just have them call me and I run the numbers before they even write the offer. I'd rather be safe than sorry. Um, when you are talking to that uh, the the realtor itself and 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 you are being told that they're looking specifically at a home, and you're questioning whether that's that they're going to qualify for that dollar amount. Can they simply say something? And I guess my question is going to be, can they simply say, well, I'm going to pay the taxes myself. You can't just disqualify. <laughs> that doesn't come out of the payment. You're still doing a calculation based on right. monthly payment, yep. regardless of whether they're... Yeah, it doesn't matter who's paying them or how they're paying them. When we qualify, we have to take those property taxes, divide them by 12, and add them to the monthly payment. So I get the pre-approval. I'm uh, now I've found a home. I'm ready to. I got an accepted offer. What are some of the do's and don'ts to get you to that closing table as quickly as possible? What are some of the do's and don'ts that you do not go out and buy a car or all your furniture? <laughs> Don't quit your job. 
don't make large deposits without talking to us Why? first. Because all large deposits have to be documented. We are going to ask you for your last two months of bank statements. Any large deposit, and that is more than 50% of your gross monthly income, we have to source where it came from with documentation. If it was a transfer from another account, we need statements on that account to show where it came from. If it was money you had under your mattress at home, we suddenly can't use it. There's no way to track where that came from. The concern there is, mm. did they go take out an unsecured loan someplace? I just had one where the customer took a, an advance on a credit card and deposited it into his bank account. We can't use those funds. They are not acceptable for a down payment on a house. And is that going to count even against their debt, too, since he... Well, yeah. Um, yeah, because now we've got a higher credit card balance Why as well. would he do that? I, he didn't ask. He just <laughs> assumed. People don't know. They make assumptions and they do things and they don't know. So be honest with us. Yeah. Tell us what you're doing because we're going to find out. Yeah. And it's better that we know up front than two days before you're supposed to close. Okay. So now I've got my pre-approval. You've already told me all I have basically with this pre-approval is I already should have had the documentation. But I'm not closing for maybe, uh, you know, for some reason the seller needs 90 days. Are you going to have to come back to me for more information or, or is is the information I already provided 90 days ago, is that going to be ex um, okay? Well, it just depends at yeah. how old it was when you started your pre-approval because, okay. you know, typically the documents are good for 120 days. Um, so, you know, we kind of have to watch. And, and same thing with that earnest money. If we're looking to see the earnest money clearing your account, a lot of times that might be a month you know we might not have that month's bank statements so then we're going to be asking for that so it just depends on the dates that you started your pre-approval and the dates you're going to close if we're going to need anything updated yep. um and one of the things you've talked about too i believe is that sometimes people come to us because the other lender or some other lender isn't open on nights and weekends have you run across any stories where customers come to us because whatever that pre-approval that they were presented originally from someone else is not strong enough to get the deal done? Does that occur? Yeah, I've had quite a few realtors that they'll get pre-approval letters from online lenders and they know that a, a seller and the seller's realtor is going to see that and they're questionable. They don't know if if there's a problem, are they going to be able to reach anybody to deal with it? So they a lot of times will send their buyers to us to get a, a, a pre-approval from a local lender, somebody that the realtors in this area are familiar with. Okay. Um, any other situations where you've actually had somebody who had an accepted offer and then all of a sudden their financing fell apart and you had to maybe come to the rescue? Is that ever? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yep. They, they've been with a different lender, maybe for their pre-approval. Um, maybe they ended up changing their program and that lender doesn't do that type of loan. Um, a lot like with non-warrantable condos and things like that, where they find that out at the last minute and and the uh, lender that they were using doesn't have that product. What is a non-warrantable condo? Um, it's basically just a condo that might still be under construction. They're still phasing. Um, there's a lot of different reasons. There's there's a lot of rental units in it that may not that may disqualify it from Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, um, and we can do those types of loans because we have our portfolio. So moving. those are options to where we can do yep. uh, you can do other types niche. of loans. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Mm -hmm. If for some reason I maybe I've changed jobs or something like that where I'm not in the same industry, are there opportunities for me to still buy a home even though I'm still making you know similar money but I don't have this two years of history? Is that correct? I have to have two years of being on the employed employed and if you were a college student that counts towards that we can get your unofficial transcripts and put that towards it too so if you're fresh out of college and just started a job that's okay um but yeah bec so we we do fannie mae freddie mac fixed mm -hmm. rate loans but we also offer portfolio loans that we keep in house so if they don't fit those fannie and freddie guidelines if it makes sense our underwriters will look at it and if it's something that we feel strongly is is a good risk will do them so yeah as long as it makes sense are you seeing more uh with the inventory being so low are we seeing more opportunities potentially with construction people wanting to build their own homes and what what does that look like what what do you, what are some of your suggestions for people who may want to build 
Um, we're definitely seeing an influx of that because there are no houses out there to purchase. So a lot of people are looking at lots and then wanting to do, um, you know, a construction loan. Um, we do have options for that, obviously, on our portfolio. So mm -hmm. we're able to do the lot loans or a lot and construction loan. Um, it, it really looks similar to a normal pre-approval process or a normal loan process. Um, we still qualify them based on the same information. Um, it's just a little bit more entailed with the builder and the plans and specs and cost breakdown, things like that. So. When they're interviewing a builder or, you know, when they approach you and say, I want to get a pre-approval, I'm going to go be meeting with the builder. What suggestions do you have that you may share with them to say, these are the things you should be asking the builder in terms of what's what are the best practices that or what are some of the cues that you can provide them obviously we I, I think we know who the reputable builders are and things of that nature but what are some of the questions that your potential borrowers need to make sure they're asking well i mean a lot of it comes down to just pricing right because that's how we qualify people so you know when they're looking at the the builder spec or whatever they might be looking at, the costs might be very different once they get into picking their their things out on the house. Um, so they just have to make sure that you know they know what their price range is or price point is, and try to stay within that as far as qualifying. And that's a, you know, even though construction is kind of hard to pre-qualify people on, I still think it's a good idea. Um, so they can they know what they're they're looking at as far as costs um, on that construction end of it because there are overruns and things like that where they're going to have to have maybe cash after closing and things like that we kind of try to prepare them for. Right, right. Well, because once that construction loan amount is set and we've closed on the mm -hmm. construction loan so they can start building, we can't change that. So if they go over on something, they have to pay for that out of pro pocket during the process. So they need to be prepared yeah. for that. And a lot of times people will put less down up front because because of that. So instead of putting 20% down, mm -hmm. maybe they're for the construction, they're only putting 15% down mm -hmm. or 10% to keep that additional funds on hand for the overages. And then uh, there's MI assigned with that. Uh, I know sometimes MI gets a <laughs> kind of a negative connotation that goes along with it. But what's the benefit of having MI, whether it's on a construction loan or just a general it allows oh. you to buy a house without having to put 20% down. Um, you don't have to have 20% down to buy a house. You will be required to pay PMI, private mortgage insurance, if you don't. It's risk-based pricing, so it's going to be based on how much you're putting down, what your loan amount is, what your credit scores are. It's really not... Horrible. No, the rates, the rates, the PMI rates have come down quite a bit in recent years. So it's surprising to see how inexpensive it can be, especially if you have good credit. And it's not forever. As soon as you've paid that balance down to 80% of the purchase price of the home, you can request to have it removed and it will fall off at 78%. So it's a small price to pay to not have to save up 20% to mm -hmm. buy a house. Or if you have 20%. Maybe you can keep some to be able to go back and buy the furniture right, and all right, the things that right. you told. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. versus putting all of your savings right, into the house. Your savings. Yeah, right. And then living off of credit. So what other suggestions do you have for people that might be looking to get pre-approved today? Do it now. Yeah. <laughs> if you're even thinking about buying a house or looking at houses, get the pre-approval done yes. first. You shouldn't even be looking at houses right. until you have a pre-approval because the whole process will move so quickly. You will see a house come on the market. You'll go look at it that day. And if you like it, you're going to have to make an offer that day. So you don't have time at that point to to try to put everything together and get a pre-approval. So if you're even considering, it's free. Once we do a pre-approval, they're good for 120 days. So just get it out of the way, get it done, and then you, you can, you're free to look. And what do I need to bring to have that pre-approval done? What do I need to have prepared to be able to? Um, it really depends on, you know, your type of where your income comes from. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you're a w 2 employee, it's really just pay stubs, W-2s. We request bank statements um, or other asset statements from where you might be getting your down payment from. Um, self-employed is a different story, obviously, then we're going to need tax returns, um, typically two years of self-employment showing you on your tax returns. Um, but other than that, it's a pretty simple process. I mean, we have an online application. They're able to upload documents right to their application, basically, for us. Um, and then we put it into underwriting. So it's a very, right now, it's a very fast process. Mm -hmm. 
So I get take the I go in and put in the online application, and then I'm waiting for something to pop in, or am I going to hear from one of you first? You'd hear from us. When we get the application, we will usually email you with the list of what we need and the instructions to upload your documents to our site. Once we have all your documents, we can usually get a pre-approval letter within one to two business days at the most. So And on weekends. <laughs> Mostly. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to Wendy and Kara for joining us on the Smart Start podcast brought to you by the Equitable Bank. One of my favorite cliches over the past several years is in these uncertain times. Truth is, there's no certainty that surrounding yourself with people who communicate and provide you with the best information will temper some of that uncertainty. Our guests today certainly check those boxes. Remember, there are no problems, only solutions. I'm Tom Sattler, and thanks for joining us on the Smart Start podcast brought to you by the Equitable Bank. Till next time.